and we're live hello everybody i hope you can all see this well uh, let's just check if everything is working fine if we are online and yeah we're good so uh, in this, welcome to this live casting. We're coding um, all sorts of applications here. We can do anything you guys would like. Today, we're going to focus on databases and talk a lot about the recent announcements and run queries as fast as we can. So, uh, if you have any comments or any questions or anything at all, feel free to comment on Twitch chat. Um, I will try to drive in the direction that you guys want. Well, so let's jump right to it. We have some very good news today from the San Francisco summit or yesterday, as I'm in <laughs> Seoul, Korea today. And in the summit, we just announced some very cool features for databases and applications. This, they are all on Jeff Barr's blog. And let's start by the new services. We just announced a new service called DAX or DynamoDB Acceleration for in-memory caching. So uh, we've, in the last episode, we talked a lot about DynamoDB and how it has provisioned throughput and you can specify as many throughput as you'd like. And the problem with this is um, the pro uh, one very frequent issue with DynamoDB is when you have a workload like this, where you have the spikes, right? So. Uh, most of the time you're under your provisioned throughput. Let's say that you're provisioned for this, but in an in an event, in an unexpected event, it goes like this. So this is if it's expected, you can always provision, but it's very hard to handle uh, spikes of unexpected traffic. And when it does, your heat map, your key access will look something like this. Uh, and this is the, a very problematic scenario. Uh, figure, for example, a news website and you have all your news, and, but then uh, a celebrity makes something stupid or somebody dies and suddenly that piece of data is accessed by everybody and while the rest of the data is not. And this is a problem because Dynamo throughput is averaged out by the number of partitions that you have. So if you have, for example, 10 partitions, each of them will have 10% of your total throughput. And if you have like uh, one specific key in one specific partition consuming or requesting like 50% of your throughput, that's going to get throttled. So how to cope with this? Um, the idea is usually to add a cache. And we have a cache in memory cache service called Elastic Cache, which provides memcached and Redis caches as a service, which is very useful for this scenario. So you can uh, put those hotkeys on cache and respond instantaneously without even going to, to disk, even if it's SSD disks and not consuming your provisioned throughput on DynamoDB. So this, um, I hope this makes sense to you guys. And let's see uh, a bit of how this works. Uh, I'm also, uh, DAX is currently on preview. And unfortunately, I couldn't get access in time for today's broadcast, so we won't be able to play with it today. But I promise you guys in the next episodes, we are going to um, load some data uh, into it. And the idea is when you create um, a cluster of DAX instances, this, this can be up to 10 nodes right now. 
they are going to sit in front of your DynamoDB transparently and you, keys are going to be cached and write with uh, write through behavior, meaning when you write to DAX, it will write to both the cache and the underlying database. And when you read, if it's not on cache, it's going to fetch from the database. And here you can see uh, what the screenshots looks like. And it's just a matter of creating the nodes. And on the when it's after it's created, you can use the a different endpoint. This you this you can configure on your SDK. This is how you connect to to DAX. And in a couple minutes, you have it up and available. And um, you can of course add or remove nodes dynamically. And this is what you should expect. It comes with a sample application, and this is the the difference. If you uh, see this get items times and um, with partition keys um, averaging in the cows of hundreds of milliseconds and um, in, in total and on average uh, 10 a dozen milliseconds or so and uh, no, no, today uh, this is Abby's broadcast about Dockerizing web app. Uh, today's is about today's broadcast is about databases my dear WMC broom d2d but I hope you like and stay <laughs> and for the query tests uh, we can have a very similar scenario and let's see when DAX is enabled you see this time is dropping dramatically you see for the house of nanosec microseconds right um, below the one millisecond as this is coming straight from memory and this is the kind of result that you can expect when running this through the java api and it's that's pretty much it and uh, let's see what we have next next we have this thing called redshift spectrum i hope we have time to play with this today if not very soon and the idea is to extend redshift to s3 data so when you um for those of you who don't know redshift this is our data warehousing service it's uh, a massively parallel processing cluster for sql data and the idea is that you have a very powerful bi database and very cost effective but up to now you could only store data on your redshift cluster and as you would with a regular database with spectrum what you can do is store data on s3 and data will be uh, you create you can create this external tables and map to your s3 locations and redshift will index this data in the cluster and let, let you query it much faster than you would if you were querying directly against s3 with athena or with hive or with uh, spark sql and things like this so uh, see for example uh, for this query taking 6.1 billion rows um, it took just like 23 seconds and this is quite impressive right and it doesn't even uh, hurt the cluster too much this is just and the pricing is very interesting all the other than the redshift costs you're charged of five dollars per terabyte of data processed so this is redshift spectrum and a new another new one is codestar codestar is our uh, developer generation developer portal for um, all sorts of applications if you know mobile hub it's pretty much the same idea 
but the thing is you can create templates for lots of different applications not only mobile including ec2 beanstalk lambda using a, a, a very wide set of scenarios so um well uh, i have good news for you mario xfs if you dream with serverless sql relational databases that's what we'll be doing in just a few seconds and with um, aws code star you can just create your project and it will build a complete um, devops pipeline for you so it will create um, your beanstalk uh, environment your code pipeline your code build it will create all the steps in your that you usually have in a continuous delivery pipeline so this is uh, continuous delivery as a service and it's it will just build um, your project and you're ready to go without having to write scripts or um, uh, configuring the config services and things like that so very cool very very cool service for new developers and uh, then some services that were announced before at reinvent that are now made available they were in preview and are now generally available the ec2 instances with fpgas those are field programmable programmable gate arrays they allow you to uh, create customized hardware acceleration so if you know logic logic gates and you know hardware design you can design this means you can design a ship uh, and make it real like it's a, a hard real hardware ship that will be dynamically adapted to your configuration so this is how um, fpgas work and the great thing about FPGA is using it with the marketplace because with AWS marketplace you can publish uh, if you are a hardware developer and you know your FPGAs for example you create one FPGA uh, for video encoding or encryption or some special kind of machine learning you can just um, publish your solution on the marketplace and everybody can consume that very 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 easily so very interesting f1 x-ray is our service for uh, inspection uh, inspect, inspecting your latencies and errors and your architecture it will go through uh, all services um, you, your lambda functions or your um, code and see how long those requests are taking and you can uh, debug things much easier with x-ray that's also announced on reinvent and it's now available with lambda integration amazon lex for building chatbots um, is now available it can uh, talk uh, you can create facebook chatbots or twilio chatbots very easily now with amazon lex and um, we now have Amazon Aurora with Postgres compatibility. Aurora is a um, database designed for AWS infrastructure. This means that uh, it's a new database. It's, um, it's a server-oriented SQL database. But the thing is, it's much, much faster than your regular old MySQL or Postgres. It's um, it used it to be compatible with only MySQL and now we have um, Postgres compatibility as well and some new features um, our image recognition service now can detect nudity and other um, kinds of <laughs> uh, dangerous content that you may want may like to moderate on Amazon Polly you can now make it whisper and make make marks and say specify how you want things to be uh, how speech is generated with Amazon Polly we uh, this is pretty cool uh, VPC endpoints for DynamoDB this means that you can make your DynamoDB tables accessible only from within your um, VPC not public to the world and 
conversational bots in mobile hub means now that mobile hub can generate uh, mobile apps that talk directly to Amazon Lex. Uh, and this is my favorite, SaaS contracts for AWS Marketplace. This means that uh, before, before SaaS contracts, AWS Marketplace allowed for one-time payment only, and now it allows recurring fees. This means that you can create your software service and it can be subscribed with a monthly fee on on AWS Mark directly on AWS Marketplace, and Amazon will manage the subscription, the charging. It will be billed to the consumer's AWS account, and you don't have to to trouble with charging. With which for many many customers is a bit of a pain, especially for those who are starting and don't have the legal and finance infrastructure to handle international payments and things like that like this hey Kapul Kapulara hi nice to meet you welcome um, we're just going through the recent announcements from the San Francisco summit and um, we now have service linked IAM roles so that delegating permissions to AWS services is a bit simpler okay and with this, um, let's jump into um, coding with our services today. And on this, I hope you got uh, everybody got those links. Let me paste this again. If you'd like to, I'll be taking notes in a gist. And here is the URL. I just pasted on Twitch chat, and this is the file. And we're going to start talking about AWS Athena. So AWS Athena is, a, is the serverless SQL that <laughs> Mario XFS is talking about. So, oh, first link don't, don't work. Twitter, JM Fairman or, yeah. Let's just make sure this works. Uh, so this is the link for the for the gist. Let's see if that works. And the link to my Twitter profile. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. And this is me on Twitter. Feel free to ask questions and interact at any time. And with Amazon Athena, it's this, just as we Mario XFS was wishing, a serverless query service for data on S3. So it's basically behind the scenes of a Facebook Presto. So this is what um, Amazon Athena is using behind the scenes. And with Presto, you have a distributed SQL engine that can run over your files wherever they are and execute SQL queries against uh, pretty much like Hive or any um, traditional MapReduce or distributed computing SQL, and here let's let's just uh, see what can we do with Amazon Athena, and there's a lot. Uh, I'll, today I'll be inspecting the GDelt dataset. So the GDelt dataset is a dataset of news and events that happen every day. And this is um, this is monitored by web crawlers, and as events are found, they are added to the dataset. And this dataset is available publicly on AWS, so uh, you can find on the GDelt on AWS page everything that you need to access it, and it's stored on S3. This means that we can easily use Athena to query data that is on the CFV files. And luckily enough, um, our 
and my friend evangelist Julian Simon this is his blog Jul the the Twitter is Julie Simon and he made um, already started doing this and we are going to reuse his code to explore the data set with Athena and the code all his code is he in, in this uh, here you can find the specs of the file so let's take a look at this and um, and the github repo his github repo is awesome as well uh, so you see that in in this in gdelt you have this kind of information then when the event happens uh, who uh, performed the event um, if it's a root or a derivated event, if it's uh, all informations that are available, uh, how many articles cite the, the event, it's just, um, and this is quite interesting, the average tone of the event, if it's a negative event or a positive event, this is all available in the GDELT dataset. And without uh, much, more let's jump right into it so on uh, this is my console let's just go to the Athena service and start creating uh, this this database so you can see here that I don't I have just the sample databases and I'm going to create a database called GDELT for mine for our app and then now we can add tables and our tables are backed by s3 so let's see how that how this bucket is is laid out i um, i have some data here on the on my events those are the lookup tables and then um, the events themselves are on s3 so let's try to uh, show you guys a bit of that layout on the on S3 in GDELT. So this is the S3 URL. I can probably just AWS S3 LS and you can see, um, uh, I have to configure my credentials and here we go. So the, you can see that there's a file for every day. Currently, those are updated daily. Uh, the last one is for the 19th. And this is available on, publicly available on S3. And this is the, the file format. Let's create a table for, for that. Those are the events themselves. And they're in, my, in one of my buckets, I have um, some metadata and lookup tables such as countries, types of events, and things like that. So for the first table, let's go to Julian. In Julian's GitHub repo, you'll find uh, this create tables.txt script, and we can create a table on GDL. Let's see how this how this actually works. So on sqlint.com I hope we can um, not I'm trying to format this let's do this let's do it in atom so in atom if we just save this to some SQL and Enable regex and replace commas with commas and new lines. We perhaps can understand this a little bit better. And replace. Yep. So great. So uh, for every column on on the CSV files, um, we map those to specific. Uh, see column names 
and let's take I actually downloaded this data set to an EC2 instance and they are being loaded right now let's um, we're going we can see those in a bit so, uh, but this is just the same definitions from that PDF name it as they and with the proper data types and the important thing is here with the definitions you can see that's pretty pretty simple we say what's the field delimiter on the csv and where those files are on s3 and done so if we create this our query is successful and we should have this gdelt data set with the events table and let's look how that is yay successful so this is um, uh, running against data that's actually on those csv files so this is our uh, serverless sql engine <laughs> pretty simple right and if if we take a look at well, uh, the biggest difference between AWS Athena and MySQL, Mario, is that MySQL stores data on the on the um, on the server, right? You know, uh, where Athena is just a just the query interpreter, and data is actually stored on S3. So um, you don't have, um, and most importantly. You ha we have to understand the difference between schema on read and schema on write. So MySQL data is a schema on write. So you have to define a schema before you write data. On schema on read solutions like Athena, you create the schema after the, the data is there. So the data is alre was already there on S3 and I just created a schema so this could be this could be red right and uh, the difference is that when you have schema on right you have an index so query queries are pretty uh, fast and effective because the data is indexed in b trees and whatever kind of index that you're using on Athena it will scan the whole set of csv files before returning your result so it's a much uh, com intensive compute operation as you don't have those indexes unless you're using redshift spectrum which we will talk in a bit right so for um, let's see some interesting queries for example we can see how many events we have so let's run a um, account star uh, from events just to see how many of those those how many there are and you can see that to return this to return this information uh, Athena must scan through all those s3 files and they are not few right right now they are i believe one per day since the since the beginning so but in julian's blog he mentions uh, the current count of files it was like uh, a uh, 1500 csv files or so then in in just Let's see the, the history. Oops. The our so in just twenty seconds, right? The the Athena engine scanned a hundred and forty gigabytes of files and more than let's see uh, this is thousands millions 40 um 4500 million table uh, rows <laughs> so this is pretty damn fast right it's probably 
uh, faster than you would have on your regular MySQL or uh, your usual database engine because Presto is a massively parallel processing tool that will use several servers to fetch this data simultaneously and count them and return it some. So this is um, this is pretty cool. Let's make some a bit more interesting queries. So with this, let's get some more code from Julian's repo and um, this is a bit different from the first table because the it's now hosted on my S3 bucket I had to download these files and they are all on the same repo so on gdelt repo you can see these countries, religion, groups. This is the; those are the the lookup tables that uh, GDelt uses for for events, and they are unfortunately not available in the in the in the data set in the master data set. So we are cre I uploaded them to my own bucket that's called GDelt events, and this is. But this data, um, uh, it's public. I, I added this bucket publicly. So if you'd like to run the same queries, it should work on everybody's account, not only mine. And run this query. It's looking good. Success. And the same thing for the um, other lookup tables. So one by one, let's get that working. This works for event codes. Now for event types oh there's a format query button here <laughs> no regex magic needed and so let's see if, if it works yay now the groups and the countries so if this works we can see for example the country list when running this query just making sure that everything works as expected all right so um, now let's uh, make more uh, interesting queries. So, um, try hard is the new Kappa asks if does Athena import the CSV files or it queries your bucket. Um, it Athena will go directly to S3. It will not fetch and store your files anywhere. Uh, by the time of the query, it will scan uh, your data. So, this is how this is how it works. Let's uh, make some cool queries now. So uh, we have a, a bit more events and let's see how many events are per year. So here it is. If, you, if there is any query you would like me to run, feel free to shoot them on Twitch chat. I will be more than happy to run these queries on your behalf. <laughs> And um, a very interesting thing is that you don't need to use the, the console. You can, of course, integrate with your application. There is a JDBC driver for Athena, so you can connect using um, Java applications or Athena drivers. Let's see. Oh, AWS Athena drivers. So here is the on the documentation page how to connect with JDBC. So if um, most J, uh, clients, a lot of there are a lot of database clients that uses JDBC. This is a um, pro very popular way to access Athena. I hope we can we see more drivers for other platforms, but uh, everything that's within the JVM, such as Java, Scala, uh, JRuby whatever groovy can connect to Athena through this JDBC driver and yeah 
and so we can see that in less than 20 seconds it again scanned our 1400 um, gigabytes uh, or uh, 140 gigabytes of data and um, with the events count and of course and for recent years we have more and more data so uh, last year it, they were 72 million events and this year we already have 21 million okay. and let's uh, see what we have again uh, top 10 event categories so this is cool because it has sub select uh, yeah yeah and so uh, try hard uh, so try hard that's really insane for the the seconds billing and uh, talking about billing it's important to understand how Athena is charged and that is five bucks per terabyte of data is scanned and the cool thing is why you're not scanning any data you're not paying anything like any uh, that's the idea behind behind the cloud and especially the serverless uh, platform it's you only pay for resources when they're actually working and with traditional SQL you would pay by the hour for the servers and things like that and um, let's run that uh, other query and the cool thing about this one is it has a sub select with a group and an order and join so it's um, an other or a different order so this is a very uh, much a much more complex query and let's see how long will this take i hope not much but soon we should see that results coming back and we don't have to wait for this one we can while this runs we can just go for an, a new query and this one will go on the background and we can make uh, new ones so let's see what we have be be before so let's see how many uh, Barack Obamas we have per year so run query and at any time we can go in the history and see those results so the top 10 events query ran in 32 seconds even with sub select and let's see the results it's right here downloaded as a C as an excel file and so we can see the most events are make a statement people making a statement um, 35 million of uh, 35 million of those making a visit hosting a visit uh, consoling appealing praising or endorsing and so on and so forth and by now the other query should be ran if it's taking too long you saw that I hope you saw that you can cancel the query while it's running this is very good, important so you don't if it runs for a long time it could cost you a lot of money so make sure um, they are not <laughs> and see that Barack Obama very little events back in 2003 but as he grew in popularity and eventually became president those skyrocketed right so that's how um, Atina works. You should be able to run Atina requests from Lambda and try hard. Um, the, I, the idea behind this is using Lambda for Java. So if you run any JVM language, uh, you can use the JDBC driver within, within Lambda to query Atina. So this is pretty, pretty straightforward any java environment like lambda or beanstalk or even your own machine can use the jdbc driver to query atina directly okay cool right uh let's see what else this is um
So let's count um, Obama and Putin events per category. Uh, wow, uh, I couldn't. <laughs> this. I wish I could write uh, more complex queries with window functions and things like this to test it out. If any of you guys is an SQL uh, is more knowledgeable about MySQL, you can pre feel free to send me queries or uh, see this data set and anytime. Uh, as I'm um, not so into this, I will just use the, the queries from Julian. And this is good because they're all on the blog and won't cost us much time. So let's just see how this how this works. And I, I think you guys got it by now how Athena works. And it is very, very cool to have a SQL um, serverless SQL engine but eventually we do have to resort to SQL eventually um, we do have to run a, a, a schema on write we, if uh, this is the idea when you, you need a really real SQL database with actual servers and to do this we have a managed service for databases called RDS so RDS here it is I have a few instances running already but I'll just launch a new one so you see how the service works on RDS you can launch a, a, a lot of different database databases just by uh, clicking through and those databases will be automatically provisioned, configured and uh, made available to you. So you can run SQL Server, several uh, flavors of SQL Server. Uh, if you can run Oracle, any many flavors of Oracle, but uh, myself, I prefer the open source databases such as Postgres and MySQL and MariaDB. So on Postgres, you is also available Mar MariaDB and MySQL. And the thing about all these engines is they are built to run on any computer. You can run MySQL on your computer, on your friend's computer, on AWS cloud, on any other cloud. And it's uh, very hard to design for performance and for flexibility at the same time, especially when you have um, infrastructure like AWS's with very particular uh, designs with availability zones, regions, and all that. So Amazon Aurora is a new database engine designed specifically for AWS infrastructures. It's, um, it automatically backups to S3. It takes advantage of multi-AZ replication and uh, a lot more design choices to make uh, this database as fast as possible and our benchmarks shows that it's around five times more throughput than MySQL and much faster to promote read replicas and you can have much more storage it grows automatically up to 64 terabytes of data so on my own the other database engines, if you have more data than you provisioned, you have to manually adjust or have um, a script reacting to CloudWatch metrics to change your database provisioning. With Aurora, all you need to do is add data and done. So we have all this, uh, several instance types. Uh, so, uh, Mario asks how to handle the connection pools from AWS Lambda. And this is a bit tricky that uh, there is an important article for understanding that. It's called Understanding Container Reuse in Lambda. So, um, in this article, Tim Wagner shows uh, the events that 
can how containers are reused and the idea is as long as you have frequent requests your um, your container uh, for your lambda functions lambda functions runs on containers and those are going to be reused and so the first time it it's up it can build your connection pool using your connection pool library it could you could use um, many c3po or uh, i think it's uh, i like hickory c i think it's hickory cp that's uh, yeah so this is what i would recommend for connection pools in jdbc and it's pretty it's crazy insanely fast so it shouldn't take much time of your com uh, of your container initialization to connect uh, to your database using hickory cp and after that's built it will be used as long your as your container is running and well uh, that's that's how how you can build connection pools with aws lambda right and so back to uh, rds we select the instance type which can run from once small t2 instance up to this very large r3 instance and we can select if we have replicas or not our database credit id for example my db our um, username run and something one two three and we can go with the advanced settings you can specify in which network and subnet you want your database to servers to leave um, your db cluster id your database name and things like this and failover how you want it to fail over how long you want backups to be retained um, how we want it to be monitored um, when you want maintenance to be performed and things like this but doing this will take um, can take a few minutes especially with this larger instance types so i did this beforehand this exact same settings and i have a um, aurora cluster running right here with this uh, jdelt name and one thing that is important is understand that this is a separate server so we need to add data to it to add data to import the gdelt data set we have to launch a new ec2 instance because we don't have access to aurora machines right we only have access to the database endpoint you can't connect to the underlying machine and import files and things like this so to import the gdelt data set i created an ec2 instance and here here it is and um i'm taking I want to have as much throughput as possible so i'm spinning uh, i3.16x large instance on my account and it, this is very very important understanding your instance types because this completely changes how you think about your limits what was big data and needed um, a nosql database for example a couple of years ago it's not the same right now you see on the ec2 inst instance types page we have instances that goes from less than one cpu and half a gig um, of memory up to very big instances for example the m416 extra large will have 64 cores and 256 gigs of ram the um, the c4s and so on and so forth each family is um, more adequate for a kind of workload and there are the, there are very interesting instance types for example the x132 extra large 
will have 128 CPUs and 2 terabytes of memory per node and 2, one, two, two terabytes disks and 10 megabytes of dedicated EBS bandwidth. With um, R4 instances, you can go much, much further. For example, on the R4 16 extra large, we have 64 gigabytes, um, 64 processors and 488 gigs of memory. And with our R3 instance, um, oh, we are using, ah, oh, the P2 instances will have um, GPU acceleration, the F1 instances, as we were commenting before, and the i3 we have today is this one i3 16 extra large with 64 gigs of uh, 64 cpus 500 gigs of memory and this is the cool thing uh, 20 gigabytes of network but this is the feature i would like to highlight it has um, eight two terabytes nvme ssds and nvme ssds are damn fast so if you want to know more about and have mvme ssds um, these are sh um, non-volatile storage in this network cards those are in the in the instance inside your your instances and made available to you so let's connect to that and see how it performs so i can connect to this and let's run a small test I have one here in in that github of uh, the github file the the gist let me get that link and here it is so on um, we will be using FIO to test this and with FIO we can say that we want to repeat random reads with Libba, uh, synchronous IO direct access to the to the resources and the name of the files, the block sizes, the IO depth, the size of the files, and so on and so forth. So the number of uh, the ratio between reads and writes, and the maximum number of jobs for parallel processing. Um, I will create a bit uh, smaller files just so it doesn't take a lot of time. Um, this is not about. Uh, this is just for fun. It's not really about databases. But let's just create uh, 10 gigabytes, 10 gigabytes. Uh, files and see how it performs. So it's it's now writing um, to disk and seeing. Um, let's leave it running and seeing how it how it performs. And while that goes on, um, I started earlier an import of the gdelt events to this MySQL database. So uh, this is the this is the command to import CSV files. To I, I downloaded the CSV files from the S3 repo to this instance, and that's why it's important to have this uh, a fast I/O with 20 gigabytes uh, to EBS, so we can really um, pr have high performance access to, to our storage resources and here's the command that it's all it's also on the on the repo and well i just exposed the credentials so you can connect to this right now and be be my guest it will it won't be up after today so no problems here and uh, this is the this is the import command so it it started uh, a while ago just importing the same data set that we have on the um, on the s on the s3 tables it's not done yet but we should have a reasonable amount of data there and 
using it's just standard MySQL, so you can use any SQL client you would like to connect to this endpoint. I'll be using the MySQL Workbench today. I already have this connection configured here. It's uh, will connect from scratch, just so you can see that it is actually the same, very same thing. So the very same uh, cluster, Aurora cluster, and let's connect. Um, it's not uh, probably a very good idea to use the tables while it's loading, but let's see if, how it, if it works. And we just connected and huh, I'm glad to hear you guys are using RDS and Lambdas and I hope you, it's definitely a good idea to use connection pools. That's, we can play that with that in a further episode if you guys would like. And let's try running those queries. Same queries we ran against Athena. Let's see how they perform on on MySQL. I will uh, suspend uh, import just so we can see how it goes. I will just Control Z this and stop just so it's not. Um, bothering our queries. Let's see how much we imported so far. So, uh, while that runs, let's talk about the, the connection time. Yeah, the setup in the static initializer is all, is all right. And a ping function that another process pings all of your lambdas to keep them warm is probably a good idea. You just have to mind that it may cost uh, it may cost a while. So well, we lost the connection here during the query. I don't know why. So let's just reconnect. And hmm. What's going on? Let's check the state of the cluster and see if it's all right. So. Working fine. And run our query. Oh, yeah. Did it time out? Let's see if this if this comes back. Um, the idea of having a ping function to keep your instances, your lambda functions, containers warm, is a good idea. Uh, it's just a, a very important thing to remember that those can cost time. Those can uh, cost. Um, use some money to keep those warm, but it is a, a good strategy. Uh, well, hmm, interesting. It lost connection to the, to the server during the query. I don't know why. Let's try running this on the, on the EC2 instance, as that's probably uh, better. So I will just connect with the same same thing and let's run it from within EC2 in a more capable machine and see what happens. While that goes on, we can show monitoring and see what's going on. So CPU utilization is all right. We can see our connections count. Everything's looking pretty normal. So memory utilization, the throughput latency, always looking pretty normal here. No, not much of load, but 
this will have to scan through all the data and no matter uh, and you can and the idea here is to show you guys how much uh, how different is running a single server versus running a massive massive massively parallel uh, processing cluster so uh, as this is the um, larger in the best service that we have it's on the br3 eight extra largest so each of those each server will be um r3 eight extra large so it's 32 gigs 32 cores 244 gigs of ram so not uh, not a small machine a very uh, a very interesting instance type but even so it's no match for um, Athena and uh, it's pretty impressive because the um, events on um, on on this table are on the um, on the server itself it's not uh, it's not on S3 being accessed remotely with uh, object storage. This is block storage, which would be faster if it was machine against machine. But as Athena is parallel, it will run much faster. But let's um, keep this query running and see how long it takes to uh, to count the the. If and, and another thing, this is just a partial data set. So this table is actually smaller than the data that we have on, on S3. On the on our FIO side, we are almost um, halfway through the through the through the process and it does not impact the, the query performance as that's running on the server, so we can leave those those running. And this should should run for more five minutes more. So, um, if Athena is using AWS Batch on the background and or they are separate, they are separate. AWS Batch is for your custom batch applications. You can run things like offline asynchronous uh, jobs with AWS Batch. Uh, try hard. Athena is actually based on Presto. So um, uh, pretty different infrastructure there, but so all right. Uh, it took two minutes and fifty three seconds to to scan the twenty seven million uh, rows in this table. It's just a fraction of what we would have on the on the. Athena, it's you can see that's much much slower even for um, a fraction of the data, yeah. and you can expect this to be much much slower on traditional MySQL. If it was not Aurora, it would take uh, much more. Oh yes, thank you. Two hundred and seventy-three million. Yes, I counted wrong, but yeah, it's still. Um, the whole data set was like it's it's about half of the data set that we had on Athena. I believe those were 4400 nearly 500 million and still uh, let's see how one of those complex queries run. Yeah. Uh, a simple group by this will take uh, much more than 30 seconds the 30 seconds it took Athena and um, we can we can even spin a regular MySQL instance if you guys would like but it would take all night to just to get through this just to import the data I can if this this is probably quite interesting I will um, write a blog post and do this offline and show you this this benchmarks and comparisons but uh, this is already more than enough to see um, the differences and um, how to how to handle this how to process this more efficiently well we can try this is the what 
what if we need the best of both worlds like we we, we want to have the uh, fast SQL qu queries that schema on write offers but we want our data on s3 and this is a frequent uh, this would make you a hard choice because if you go uh, Athena you would need to query and scan the whole thing every time and if you go RDS um, you would have to import all data from s3 so a maximum number of connections on RDS that depends Mario on the um, instance type every instance type will have a different number of max connections uh, I think that's on the documentation but let's get to that so huh. this was actually tested so um, you can uh, this is the the formula the DB instance class memory divided by this interesting magic number this will give you the number of connections you can have per instance type so on our uh, we can have thousands of connections easily on our on our 16 x uh, 8 extra large instance uh, probably around 10,000 and not yet and not yet so let's con let's continue uh, with what we were saying that we would like to have the best of both worlds so data on s3 and indexed sql query performance and this is exactly what we announced yesterday at the san francisco summit the redshift um, the redshift spectrum service so let's go back to the to the blog AWS Redshift Spectrum. So with Spectrum, you create a Redshift cluster, but instead of storing your data in the Redshift cluster itself, as it used to do before, it now can query data sets directly on S3 so you will have um, a, a schema created this schema can can be the same amazon athena schema that we had and it's just uh, as easy as that and then you can create your tables and uh, the thing is now data will be living in s3 but in just indexed by your redshift cluster and we'll be we will be able to query it much much faster and we um i did start the creation of a redshift cluster earlier let's see if that's done so on let's reload these pages on redshift here it is our cluster it is available and healthy but no inbound permissions I will edit the security group so we can allow uh, external connections I will allow external connections from anywhere um, what is the port again 5429 from anywhere so you guys <laughs> can connect if you'd like and we can run any SQL uh, engine or client to run this I'm not much of a Postgres guy but Let's try running on SQL Workbench. Uh, SQL Workbench for J. 
this is a regular JDBC client. I uh, will add a driver, so manage drivers. Add the, the Postgres driver. It's not actually the Postgres driver, it's the, it's the Redshift. And Redshift driver, I downloaded. This is the, it's on the documentation page. Shift JDBC driver. So here you can obtain the driver and connect. So we will need this class name for the driver and the file. So on SQL4j, I'll open uh, it's on local uh, work docs. Go work code. GDBC Redshift. So this is the latest driver and the class name and the sample URL is like this. Configure the driver. So now let's do GDELT. And with the reg with the driver, and we should have the URL right there on the console. And the database name is gdelt. Username, password, it's the same. Let's test if it connects. Successful. Okay. Ta -da. So now we are connected. We can proceed uh, to create our schema. And let's see how that how that is. So to create an external schema, here is how it works for an existing um, Dialog. Let's see if um, we have a for an existing. Uh, let's see on if the database is on Athena. Just to make sure I'm on the right thing. I, this is the very first time I use this service. It was announced very very recently. <laughs> so let's see how it works. And if you manage your catalog using Athena, that's us. Specify the Athena database name and the AWS region in which it's located. So this should be it. Uh, let's just replace with our values. So uh, Athena schema from data catalog and um, database is called GDELT. We need an IAM role to allow Redshift to write to this. Um, to, uh, so let's pick on IAM. I already have this role created here. So it's just allowing everything right now, but please don't uh, do this. <laughs> just allow, you can just allow access to S3. And region is US East one. And uh, let's see if it works. So Athena schema created. Huh. Ah, let me call this G dot just for consistency. And the schema was created. So now Redshift cluster. Uh, I created this cluster before. Let me show how it is configured. It's running on DC one AX large instances. Let me just show you how this how this is. So those are the fastest instance types available on US East one. <coughs> so those will be 32 gigs of uh, 32 CPUs, 24 
244 gigs of RAM and two terabyte SSD nodes at five bucks per hour nearly. And now we probably can start queries um, against our database. So let's pick the same ones on count. Um, Failure to incorporate external table into local catalog. Hmm. Why didn't this work? That would require some some logging and debugging. Hmm. Let's try to figure this out. Does Let's just read a bit through the through the docs with you guys. I hope you guys don't mind, but sometimes that's what what it takes, right? Some debugging, and if not, if it doesn't work, I can get it up um, later and help you guys and show you guys afterwards. So um, this should be this should be pretty this is pretty straightforward there's not much to, to be wrong let's see the let's see if it created the, the cluster the the schema uh, current transactions well I'm sorry that this doesn't work I'm not sure exactly why let's see if we can make another example let's try the hmm. but to try the other example I would need another data set let's see how Jeff does it if it if there if it's any different and oh okay um let's let's try this this approach and create external schema if not exists g dot two our second attempt and run it huh it's this no. oh it's it's all one from data catalog database um I will be as close as possible to the example so we don't miss. Database S3 region US East 1 IAM role the our service role this is would be it our redshift role on IAM to allow redshift clusters to call AWS services on our behalf so this should be this should be good it's a bit different uh, yeah that's that's okay and create external database if not exists yep so let's try this now huh. invalid invalid transaction blocks comments ignored until the end of current transaction blocks how to quit transactions in 
Redshift in Postgres. I don't know how this how this works. Uh, it should have a stop button or quit or interrupt transaction. I don't know how to quit this query. Hmm. Let's see if we have something on the Redshift management console to help us here. So on queries, we should be able to see the queries, the last queries and perhaps stop them. Yeah, if we have terminate queries. So this can help us finish this uh, past errors. So yeah, this was terminated. Oh, it's currently undoing. Hmm. But should work. No, 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 not yet. Well, I will have to to check this out and get it back to you guys. I really don't know. I will have to talk to the experts on this, but this um, I'll leave it to them to the next episode, or unless someone knows what this current transact how to and transactions or how to delimit transactions on on this tool. Uh, perhaps hmm, connecting with a different tool. I don't know. Well, I'm not. I will not guess and keep debugging and wasting everyone's time. Um, I'll just fix it. And on the next episode, I show you guys uh, what was wrong actually. But the idea is using. Um, spectrum it should be pretty much faster see it's the same syntax the same idea of creating external tables on s3 that are with data stored on s3 but those redshift instances will build the index of that data so you can uh, run very uh, much faster queries so in this in jeff's example uh, they were thousands millions billions it was six billion columns and the query took 33 seconds so you can see that it is clearly much much faster than uh, either Athena directly because it's indexed or data that would run on RDS for example and uh, for processing all the rows uh, it's like six billion rows in a single query with grouping and uh, and filtering it and just finding these four rows. It took just um, two hundred and fifty three seconds. That's four and a half minutes, right? So you can see that it's uh, for scanning six billion rows. It's uh, pretty impressive and it doesn't even you could even run much of those simultaneously as those didn't take uh, much utilization on your cluster on the cluster after all so um, I hope you guys are better at SQL than I am and can try Redshift Spectrum today so uh, with this uh, I'd like to show you guys that it's not an uh, easy choice between SQL and NoSQL that there's a lot to consider because you can run SQL in so many different environments and clusters that uh, many people have the idea that SQL is not performant or not scalable. And as you can see, we can run SQL against billions of rows on data stored on text files very quickly on S3. So this really changes the perspective of what SQL databases can do. And it's, uh, but at the same time, we have, we offer no SQL databases with DynamoDB and DynamoDB acceleration that was launched yesterday. So you can have very, very fast transactions with uh, with mm, your NoSQL data with again uh, parallel perf uh, processing and other things that 
a redshift brain stream. So it, um, in the end, or, and of course you can always build your favorite database. You can run MongoDB, you can run any database that you would like on EC2. Um, the, the most important concept behind to understand is that of schema on reads and schema on writes because this is what makes them the magic works with Athena. Schema is um, being interpreted as data is being read through. So it's of course is lower to, to read than if you have indexed data. With indexed data, as you have on RDS Aurora, for example, it is much faster um, usually, but for massive workloads, having just a single uh, server, a single query analyzer, it's not enough to go through the whole data set. So ideally for um, this high scale analytics, for making reports against billions of row, you would need the, the best of both worlds. And this would be Redshift Spectrum with, as you would have data on S3 and indexes on Redshift clusters. I'm sorry, we didn't, we couldn't, I couldn't make that work today, but uh, for the next episode, we can uh, come back today to that. And um, go, please take a look at the, um, AWS blog, Jeff's blog, for the recent announcements, and um, you can. This is all there. In our gist, we have links to to all of the things I mentioned. Especially, um, I would like to thank Julian Simon for this excellent blog post on how to explore the GDELT dataset with Amazon Athena. That's what we ran today. He is Joe Simon on Twitter and it was very very helpful to find that that i didn't had to write all those queries myself and uh, that's it for for today's episode we have we already talked about content and web applications distribution in the first and then we talked about lambda functions and api gateways then dynamodb now SQL and no SQL, and with that we have all the components to to build um, highly scalable application. And in the next in the next broadcast, we are going to talk about analytics, especially uh, live analytics with uh, tools such as AWS Kinesis and things like this. So I hope um, to see you guys. Uh, Abby is, is soon talking about Docker. Randall will be broadcasting soon. We are from the developer relations team and our job is to be here talking developer to developer and show, showing how things actually work and helping you guys be successful on AWS. Thank you very much. See you guys next time.